Daniel chapter 6 this morning as we continue our study in the book of Daniel. I want to draw your guys' attention to a portion of scripture in the Bible. As you find your place in Daniel chapter 6, I want to draw your attention to a specific passage in scripture. The passage in mind reminds us concerning the trials that one may face in life. And one of the things that we need to always keep in mind and remember about trials, kind of like the song that we sang tonight about trials, or this morning, this last song, about trials, what a friend we have in Jesus. Because it seems that people draw closer to Jesus in trials. And Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul reminds the Corinthian believers to not be ignorant of the trials that might come upon them. Paul has often been noted for quoting to not be ignorant. He made it very clear in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12 in regards to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He says, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. He also made it clear in Romans chapter 11 in verse 25 in in regards to God's future plan with Israel. He says, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And then we also see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 that once again Paul the Apostle says concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. It's interesting because when it comes to God's future plan with Israel, when it comes to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, these are the three things that the body of Christ is most ignorant on. And these three things have caused great divisions within the church. These topics and areas of doctrine have created mainstream denominations and the body of Christ has been split because of these things. But the area of trials doesn't matter what view you hold, every denomination, every church, and every believer experiences trials in their life. Everybody does. And so Paul goes on to say to the Corinthian believers in regards to trials, don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. As a matter of fact, Peter would go on to remind us and encourage us that in the areas of trials, you and I need to be fully aware that trials will take place. He makes it very clear in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, listen to this, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Don't think it's strange. And then when a trial does come, don't question as to why am I going through this, is really what he's saying. That is the most basic translation of that verse. So what is Peter saying? Unlike Paul, Paul says, don't be ignorant of trials. Peter is saying, expect trials. So with these two things, notice what else Peter says, he says in verse 13 of 1 Peter 4, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. This is interesting. No one never takes this approach when they're going through a trial. No one ever compares their trial to what Jesus went through for them. Whenever we go through a trial or we're pressed down or weighed down with something going on in our life, the first response is not, an intellectual response in the Word of God, our first response is to this feeling we get in our chest. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like this awful feeling. That's our first response to a trial. Then we begin to try to rationalize in our mind as to, one, how this happened to me, and two, what am I going to do now? And three... Where's God in all this? It seems that God becomes the last person on our list as we work our way through trials. As if God would be just as surprised as we are about our trial. And two, as if God is incapable 
of helping us in our trials. And keep in mind that the believer, the Christian, let me tell you something, will always have trials in their life. And sometimes we say it this way, Christians have trials, but the world has trials too. Trials are in and outside of the Christian faith. Trials are trials no matter how you look at it. The only difference the believer has against anyone else is that the Lord is with us in the midst of our trials. So I want you to title Daniel chapter 6, Never Too Old for Trials. The question has been asked, how long will you and I have trials in our lives? Well, guess what? If the world has problems, and since the beginning of time, the world has always had problems, and we can equate those problems to trials in individuals' lives, remember that. I think Peter made the distinction very clear in 1 Peter in chapter 4, once again, as you take your mind there. He says in verses 14 and 15, he says, listen, if we are going to be involved in trials, may our trials be for Christ's sake. If there are any trials that you and I are going to face, may they be because of who we are in Christ Jesus. And then Peter goes on to say, listen, there are trials that we do experience because of our own ignorance or stupidity. There are trials that we bring upon ourselves, Peter goes on to say. He says, if you're going to go through a trial, may it never be as a murderer, as a thief, or as a busybody. The Greek word for busybody is comadre, all right? <laughs> Put that in your notes. And it's interesting that he would take, just think about this, it's interesting that he would take the term busybody or a gossiper. Think about this, a gossiper in the murder right or wrong. And we would be less, we would still give a judgment for gossip, but we would not be as harsh as our judgment for murder, right? Listen, guys, a gossiper, very much so, does the same thing a murderer does. A gossiper murders and slanders another's character. You might say, what about a thief? Gossip will steal the pure reputation of one in the mind of a person because someone goes and tells something about the person to make themselves look better than the one they're gossiping about. Now tonight, or today, we're not going to be talking about gossiping, but we will be talking about trials. Peter said, listen, if you're going to suffer, suffer for Christ's sake, not for your stupidity. Remember what we said, we say time and time again, you can choose your sin. God, God does not oppose you to choosing your sin. We could do whatever we want. It's not good for us. But what you cannot choose is the consequences of your sin. And this is kind of the idea that Peter has as far as uh, cause and effect for trials, right? But here... As Paul is reminding the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians, he's saying, listen, don't be ignorant about trials. Trials are going to come. Think about it. Do you remember the trials you had before you came to Christ? Yes, there was a lot of problems in my life. And then you became a Christian, and guess what? There are still problems in your life. Right? Absolutely. But the difference is Christ in us, the Bible says, is the hope of glory. So now we are right away, because of who Jesus is, given some immediate experience with trials. Because Jesus then begins to walk us through these trials. And it's interesting that in the book of Daniel, we've seen Jesus time and time again walk through the trials with those that have experienced some trials. Now, remember what I told you. The title of the message is, Never Too Old for Trials. How long will I go through trials, Pastor David, until Jesus comes back for you or until um, your time is up and you step into eternity? The good thing is there's no trials in eternity. Can I get a witness? Good. The Bible says in chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 set traps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, 
that the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Last week we looked at chapter 5 towards the end of the verses here and we saw the end of the Babylonian Empire and the very rise of the Medo-Persian Empire. One of the things we found out to be true that it wasn't Cyrus the king who defeated Babylon. It was a general from the army that surrounded Babylon. Most likely, according to history, an individual by the name of Gaburu. Gaburu could possibly also be this individual in verse 1 of chapter 6 named Darius because the word Darius or the name is more of a title than an actual name. And there's been much kind of question on this. There are several views as to who this Darius is. Some say that this was Cyrus also, one and the same person. It's just a title given. But he is to not be confused with the latter Darius who would reign right around 522 B.C. and on. So who is this Darius? Some believe that this Darius is the individual Gaburu who penetrated this unpregnable city, Babylon, and was able to get in some time later in the same month, the month of August, that we see in 539 B.C. that this took place, is when Cyrus also came on the scene. And perhaps it's believed that Cyrus left this individual in charge to put things in order. Now, when you get to chapter 9, we're barely in chapter 6, when you get to chapter 9, it starts to talk about Darius again as if this is his first year in his reign. Now remember, guys, the confusion as some would look at this, they forget and they fail to realize that chapter 7 and 8 take place in between chapters 4 and 5. So now that pushes chapter 9 all the way up to where we are right now. So because we're not studying it in chronological order this morning, this is why it seems a bit out of, well, time has passed between these chapters, Pastor. Well, there's also other chapters that took place in between chapters 4 and 5. So this Darius here was set over the kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon. The kingdom of Babylon has been destroyed 539 B.C. because this is what the vision or the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had declared. Remember in chapter 2, the, the image, the head of this image was gold, right? And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, this is you. And then as Nebuchadnezzar views the image, he also notices that the chest and the arms of the image are silver. And this is an inferior metal to gold. The point that Daniel was making is a kingdom inferior to you will defeat you. And that is the Medo-Persian Empire. No kingdom was greater than Babylon in that day. So with the defeat of Babylon here at the end of chapter 5, and the start of the reign of the Medo-Persian Empire does one thing. It declares to you and I that God's word is truth. And the prophecy given to Nebuchadnezzar through the dream that he had was fulfilled by the very word of the Lord. Now the Medo-Persian Empire is in power and they have placed this Darius to set over the kingdom 120 set traps. Set traps are... Um, governors within the province who will be assisting the king himself. So 120 of these officials to be over the whole kingdom. Well, the Bible says here that these individuals, as they were placed over, there were three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them. So now three officials over them, Daniel being one of them. So now this puts Daniel above this 120 individuals. So it would seem that there would be 122, 23 individuals that would rule, but three of them would be set apart to deal directly with the king. Well, Daniel obviously being one of them. Daniel, by this time, it's believed that he's already passed his 80s. Daniel is about 86 years old. And Daniel now, once again, has been in the kingdom of Babylon for a number of years, and he's seen the entire captivity of the people. Seventy years captivity now has come to an end, and Daniel has lived throughout this entire captivity. And once again, the Lord, faithful to his word, defeats the kingdom of Babylon, raises up the Medo-Persian Empire, and now Daniel's 
character, name, and witness is brought into question. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, the Bible says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Daniel's life was a life of humility, not one of perfection, but one of humility. How is it that Daniel lived a life of over 70 years in this kingdom without anything that anybody could say to him or speak against his character or his attitude? I think one principle comes to mind. That if we first take care of what's on God's heart, he'll then take care of what's on ours. Daniel lived this model very clearly. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 in verse 33, that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all things will be added unto you. That, that is a very strong principle that every believer should understand, just as much as trials will take place in our lives. Now look at this. The Bible goes on to say here, that Daniel, along with these other individuals, were placed that they might give an account so that the king would suffer no loss, perhaps during this time of invasion. Remember, Babylon's destroyed this other kingdom here. Well, guess what? It's a massive kingdom. To keep things in order, to keep people accountable, they prepare to set things in order. And here we see the life of a man named Daniel and his love for God. The Bible says in verse 3, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the set traps because an excellent spirit was in him. Notice that, an excellent spirit in Daniel. Now in Daniel chapter 1, we see that Daniel did have a right spirit from the very get-go. Where did it start? In verse 8 of chapter 1, the Bible says this, But Daniel purposed in his heart. This is where this right spirit came from. Daniel purposed in his heart. Remember that it was there in Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 8, when Daniel purposed in his heart to what? To not worship Nebuchadnezzar or the kings or the false gods of Babylon. Daniel's witness has always been impeccable before the king. And then in, in chapter 1 in verses 19 and 20, the Bible says that after Daniel went through that first trial, God gave him favor with the king. And the king viewed Daniel and he realized that Daniel far exceeded ten times more the wisdom and the knowledge of some of the greatest men that Babylon could produce. Daniel purposed in his heart to stand on the promises of God's word. And some would say, well, how do you know he was standing on the promises of God's word? He never quoted the word of God. You see, guys, listen. The word of God is for some to be quoted, but for others to be lived. Some people don't even have to speak a word about God's word. But if they live it out, that is the greatest Bible that people will ever see. You living out your Christian faith. As a matter of fact, remember, everybody says, well, how is the issue with Daniel? I mean, think about it. Daniel let them change his name. Daniel allowed them to take him out of captivity and put him in Babylon. Daniel even allowed them to bring his friends with him. And so here they are. They're changing his name. They're changing his country. Daniel even said, I'm willing to go and learn all that the Babylonian Empire in their education can teach me. But when it came to eating from the king's table, Daniel said no. Remember, guys, that to eat from a king's table, especially a Gentile king, all their meat, all of it, is offered first to their gods. And it is forbidden in the law of God's people in the book of Exodus to eat any meat that has been offered to idols. And not only that, the Bible also goes on to say this, that as one, if he can trust in the Lord and wait in the Lord and know that God will honor what they're doing, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 23 in verse 25, that as they serve the Lord their God with all their heart, that the Lord will bless their bread and their water. Isn't that interesting that that's what the law says? Well, remember what Daniel asked for? I won't eat the delicacies of the king. Just give me bread and water. He didn't have to preach a sermon to a Gentile official that would not understand what the law of God says. All he had to do was just live it out. So see, Daniel knew 
that if I purpose in my heart and stand upon the word of God, I don't have to explain what God's word says. I just have to live it out. Just give me bread and water. Let everybody else eat the delicacies of the king. And in 10 days, let's check things out. 10 days later, Daniel and his buddies were fatter, healthier, and better looking than all those that were eating the king's delicacies. It's so funny when people say, oh, I'm going to go on a Daniel fast. Uh, Daniel's fast? Yes. Yes, I'm going to do that. Then all of a sudden you look at them, you're like, whoa, what happened to you, man? You hitting the pipe again or what? <laughs> oh, no, I'm fasting. I'm, I'm fasting. Very humble, very spiritual. Yeah, what kind of fast? The Daniel fast. Bread and water. I don't think you're doing it right. Why? Because you look like you've just been eating bread and water. The Bible says at the end of 10 days, Daniel was healthier, chubbier. There's nothing wrong with being chubby, guys, okay? <laughs> Chubby's the new fit. Trust me, I know, I'm leading this movement. But they were healthier, they were chubbier, they looked better, their skin looked better, their hair, everything looked better. Why? That's the Daniel fast he purposed in his heart. You see, fasting is not some religious exercise to, to, to say, oh, you know, I'm so spiritual, I have to do this. No, fasting is denying the flesh of what it wants and giving God glory. It doesn't have to be food, it can be other things too. So what's the whole point of Daniel's character? Since day one, Daniel purposed in his heart to honor the Lord. What was in his heart? The word of God. You can take me out of, uh, out of Judah into Babylon. You can change my name. You can instruct me in the education of Babylon. But you can't take away my God. You see that? We can be witnesses and representatives of the truth of God's word no matter where we are, even in the midst of false religion. You see, it's an act of the heart. This is what Daniel did. It encouraged Daniel and his friends. And throughout his entire life, Daniel lived this life that was honorable before the Lord. Why? Because that's what mattered to Daniel, not what men thought of him, but what God knew of him. And so when one understands this with trials, then you will understand very clearly that trials are for the purpose of what? What are trials for if we're going to have them and if we got to go through them? I believe trials serve two purposes. Jot it down if you're taking notes. Point number one. As Spurgeon said that a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that could not be trusted. I think trials show you who you really are. Some people say, oh, you know, God allowed me to go into a trial because he's testing me. God doesn't need to test you because he's trying to figure out, let me see if you're real or not. God knows if you're real or not. He doesn't need to know. You need to know. The second thing trials do is trials cause us to grow. Remember, there in the book of Acts, trials served the same two purposes. One, it separated the real from the fake. And number two, the greater the trials in the book of Acts to the early church, the more the church grew. Trials cause us to spread out. Trials cause us to be effective as we go and we declare. So somebody says, well, what do I do when I'm going through a trial or I feel so, you know, overwhelmed with trials? Let me tell you something. Evangelize. Go tell people about Jesus. Your whole perspective in your trial will change because... You're speaking about the one who is with you in the midst of your trial. So go and do something. Get, you know, get out, get involved, get, you know, get busy. And people, when they go through a trial, they, they, they isolate themselves or they, or they clump themselves up with someone else who is going through it too. And there they are licking each other's wounds and woe, woe is me. And the trial will last a little bit longer. It's kind of like you guys have heard the expression, right? Christians are like manure. You know that, right? Some of you are like, I don't like this, Pastor. <laughs> oh, trust me, we are. We are. We do a lot of good when we're spread out. But we begin to stink when we're clumped up together. 
We do a lot of good spread out. You see, trials, guys, listen, cannot and will not overtake you because Jesus promised that. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trials and tribulations, but do not fear, for I have overcome the world. The point Jesus is making, trials are going to come, but in no way can they overtake you. What they can do is last a little bit longer than they're supposed to. Because sometimes we give in to the, the trial. So look at Daniel doesn't even realize here at 86 years old, you would probably figure, well, here they are. They get this old guy, Daniel, and they're probably thinking he's been here long enough. He's one of the captives of Judah. He knows what's going on. Perhaps I'm not saying that Daniel's thinking this way, but I'm just saying somebody this old would think, yeah, I can do. I can help you guys out. I have a lot of experience. But look at what happens. The Bible says that he's recognized for an excellent spirit that was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Daniel's life and history, guys, in Babylon is in reference to his relationship with God. This king, not knowing Daniel, wanted to place him over everything. Keep in mind that in verses 3 and 4, right around here, the people of Judah according to the history, have already started making their way back into Jerusalem. Daniel doesn't go. He remains. So the governors, the satraps, sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was a faithful, that he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. And look at what it says here. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Why is it that these individuals all of a sudden turned against Daniel when the very king who has authority over them has a desire to place this Daniel over them? I believe the issue is jealousy. Daniel didn't do anything to invite this type of deception or this plan to destroy Daniel other than that these individuals didn't have the same heart that Daniel had and their desire was to charge Daniel with something most likely that was not true. You ever had people come against you with something that wasn't true? Daniel... Unbeknownst to him, the issue that is now arising in the backdrop is simply doing what he's always done before. Keeping his faith in God, trusting the Lord. But notice what the Bible says here. They sought to find some type of charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. It doesn't say that he was perfect. It doesn't say that he was without sin. It says that Daniel was faithful. Keep in mind that in no way does this passage teach that Daniel was sinless. He wasn't. The point being made is that Daniel lived his life before the Lord God to bring glory to him. And what that does is it sets you in a different place than others. You see, guys, listen, when you are a Christian and you're truly living out your Christian faith, people are going to hate you just because of that. People are going to hate you because you don't agree with their way of fun. People are going to hate you because perhaps maybe you don't want to get involved in the things that they're involved in. People will come against you at work, especially if you stand for your Christian faith and they want to involve you in things that would, in some degree, perhaps be detrimental to their place of employment at work. Some of those things are perhaps taking a little bit of things from work that you know you probably shouldn't be taking, but you can get away with it. Doesn't mean that it's okay. Doesn't even mean that it's okay because the boss says it's okay. Go ahead and take it. I take some home too. You see, the true believer will not just take it because the boss says. The true believer will say, well, hold on. Does the company as a whole know what I'm doing? A true believer would say, I'd rather not take it if I have to hide it on my way out. You see, oftentimes people are judged at work because of their integrity or perhaps when a bunch of uh, employees are together or pe wherever you are, school, doesn't matter where you're at, and all of a sudden there they are with their coarse gesturing, their foul jokes. And they start saying things and all of a sudden everybody laughs and you don't laugh. They say, why aren't you laughing? You don't think it's funny? Uh, I, don't, I don't talk like that. The second you do that, prepare for them to try everything they can to discourage you, 
because they will hate you. They will. It's so true, guys, that so many Christians can easily get swayed by the people around them, but see Daniel purposed in his heart to never be moved by those around him. His desire was to be moved by God. They wanted to create a law contrary to the law of God because that's the only way that he would break the law. Remember in Romans chapter 13, the Bible says that God places those who are in authority, and if that is the case, then those that are in authority are the creators of the law. And so that means that God would want us to respect the laws of the land. We need to obey the laws of the land. Sometimes people don't realize they might have never taken something from work. They might have never been given something from work. And they can say, well, my hands are clean. I've never stole from work. But let me tell you something. If you're talking at work about something that's not work related and it's not break time or lunch time, you're stealing from your job. If you clock in and you drag your feet and take about 15 minutes to get to your workstation, you just stole 15. You're a thief. You signed a contract, an application, and agreed to be paid a certain amount of dollars per hour for work. Not talking, not kicking back, not dragging your feet, not wasting time. So Christians do steal without having to take anything physically. They steal. And listen, some would say, oh, that's not that. Come on now. They had a question. They're going through something. You should tell them, let's talk at break. You see, guys, I, I, for one, practiced this faithfully where I worked. Faithfully, seven years at the same company, I practiced this. And when the time came for me to start a Bible study, I had 40 employees attending my Bible study at work. We would all eat our lunch at first break, and we would take our lunch and our last break together, approved by the uh, distribution manager. And what we would do is we would have a 45-minute Bible study. That's kind of how Living Way started. Those people begin to attend the Bible study in the backyard. And one of the things that people say is, hey, you might not like David, you might not love him, but let me tell you something. That man is above reproach at work. In no way did he ever want anybody to say, oh, you're a Christian? Look at what you're doing. And trust me, everything I did, boy, I had to walk on eggshells. Any little thing I said, if it didn't sound right, let me tell you something. What non-believers can judge you on, they can judge you on your attitude and character in reference to life itself, but they can never judge you according to God's word because they don't know it. But what they will say is, oh, you said that and you're a Christian? And so keep in mind that the enemy is always trying to judge us and always trying to challenge us and always wanting us to get out of character. Always. Now, I'm not saying that I was the best representative of the Lord. And let me tell you, a lot of this was through trial and error. But boy, I realized very quickly how much people do watch you and how much they pay attention to you and how quick they are to say, and I thought you were a Christian. The sad thing is when other Christians begin to say that about their own fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. These individuals were jealous. You ever met somebody that is jealous of you? They're jealous of the way you look. They're jealous of the way you talk. They're, they're jealous of the position or the title you hold. They're jealous of your friendship that you have perhaps with someone else. These were jealous. They were jealous of Daniel. They were upset that the king would choose Daniel over them. And thus, together, this entire group of 120 came to attack Daniel, unbeknownst to Daniel. And yes, on the greater grand scheme of things, it wasn't just these individuals. It was the devil himself trying to disrupt God's purpose and plan among God's people. Keep in mind that the backdrop is the people are leaving their captivity and going back into their land. You think the enemy is excited about that? No. No. And he works in all types of ways. Remember what Peter said, various trials. Why does he say various trials? Some are going to be big. Some are going to be small. They're going to come in all shapes and sizes. Here's one that Daniel doesn't even know about. Do you guys know that there are trials already brewing in your life that you have no clue that are going to hit yet? 
They're on their way. Oh boy, nobody wanted to hear this message this morning, huh? <laughs> well, here is a jealous plot, just like we see in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 8. Just like we also seen in Genesis chapter 37 in verses 18 through 24, Joseph and his brothers. And so guess what they did? Since they couldn't find no fault or anything to speak against Daniel, they said, well, the only way we can get to Daniel is this. He faithfully follows the law of his God. What if we create a law, listen to this, that will cause him to violate his, God, his God's law because he won't keep it if it does? You see that? We're going to create a law in the land that will be contrary to his God's law. And what he will not do is he won't break the law of his God. So if he doesn't break the law of his God, he will then break the law of the land. Now remember, some people ask the question, well, then aren't we to obey the laws of the land? Romans 13 says that, yes, we are. But the Bible also says in Acts chapter 4, verse 19, jot it down, please. Acts 4, 19, in Acts chapter 5, in verse 29, guess what it says? It says we are to obey the laws of the land until the laws of the land require or demand of us to break God's law. You don't have to obey it. You don't have to obey it. This is what they're doing. So all of a sudden here, this is their plan. So these governors, set traps, thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. Notice the way they're, they're prepping and priming him. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the set traps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statue and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions, listen to this, any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, they, they created this thing. And what are they doing? Verses 6 and 7, jot it down, please, in your notes. They are now treating this Darius as if he himself is a god. That's not far-stretched. Nebuchadnezzar did the same thing, did he not? He built that huge statue, declared himself to be God. This was a common practice among the ancient Near East king, Gentile kings. They would deify themselves. And trust me, this king here clearly thought that he could be viewed this way and worshipped this way. Why? Because these 122 officials that he placed in charge, they're coming to him and they're saying, Long live the king. You are worthy of the kingdom's worship. He doesn't know they have Daniel in mind. And Daniel doesn't know that they have him in mind. Think about this. And they're going and they're setting this all up. But what they fail to realize is who this Daniel is. Think about this, guys. So they said, now, O king, establish a decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Here we have a constitutional monarchy within the kingdom of Persia. Now, some would view this and they would say, it just goes to show that Darius didn't have as much authority as Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was able to change the law. Remember that? But they can't here. Neither could Esther. In her day, this is all around the same time here. This is it. The law could not be altered. Remember that. Now keep in mind here for a moment, guys, as we look at this here, they're saying here, once a law is signed by the king, it could not be in any way altered or changed. So they made it the law. Therefore, the king Darius signed the written decree. Wow. Wow. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, this, this is what blows me away. Daniel knew now. Daniel didn't know that the reason why they put this law in effect was so that these officials could catch him and him be killed. He doesn't know that he has this against him. What he does know is that a new law came out and that this law will require everybody to not pray to their God and the Bible says here in verse 10 that Daniel knew. What did Daniel know? Daniel knew the law that was written. He knew the writing was signed. Daniel had a peace in his heart. In Philippians chapter 4, jot it down, verses 6 and 7, the Bible speaks to us a reality, the truth about the very peace of God. The Bible says it's this very peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Look at verse 6 of chapter 4 of Philippians. It says, be anxious for nothing. I love that. Do you guys know that anxiousness is sin? It's worry. You're not to worry. 
One once is given, one a person is given over to worry, they're no longer trusting in the Lord. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Why? Why would I do that? Because the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that effective there? Think about that. This is why we're not to be anxious for nothing. Why? Because it gives room for God to work mightily on your behalf and to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. When the Bible says in chapter 6 and verse 10 of Daniel that Daniel knew, well, Daniel had this perspective in mind. He had a peace. And look at what the Bible, you might say, how do you know he had a peace? The Bible says he went home. He went home. He didn't try to go to the king and say, what is all this about? Do you understand I have to pray to my God? Do you understand that if I don't pray to my God, well, then you know what? I'm sinning against my God. No, at all whatsoever. What Daniel did is he went home. He had a peace. Okay, king, if this is what you desire, so be it. But what you're desiring goes against what my God teaches me. The Bible says he went home and in, the, and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom. Listen to this, since early days. Well, there's a problem here now. Nobody was allowed to pray, listen to this, to pray or to give petitions to any God or any man for 30 days Daniel sees the law, sees it signed, and what does he do? He goes home and he begins to pray. He opens his windows, the Bible says. He sets his face toward Jerusalem, and he doesn't open his windows so everybody can see. As a matter of fact, nobody can see. He's in an upper room. But if this is what he's done since his early days, everybody in that province would know that when that man's upper room windows are open... His face is set toward Jerusalem, and he's praying to his God. Daniel began to pray to the Lord. Some would say, why would Daniel pray to the Lord toward Jerusalem? In 1 Kings chapter 8, in verse 22, remember when Solomon prayed. He prayed and he cried out to the Lord as he dedicated the temple. And he went on to say that, Lord, that as this temple sits here in Jerusalem, no matter where a person is on the face of the earth, may they set their face toward Jerusalem as they pray. That's all Daniel was doing. And why would Daniel do that? Because Solomon says, and Lord, if they do that, hear their prayer no matter where they are. Guys, you know that the Lord hears our prayers no matter where we are. No matter where you are physically and no matter where you are spiritually, a child of God has the assurance that God hears our prayers. You know what's so mind-blowing? You can be anywhere on the face of the earth. Listen, I've traveled extensively. Middle East, Africa, all over. And there's one thing I do no matter where I go. No matter what part of the world I'm in, I always make it a point to step outside at nighttime no matter where I'm at, and look at the moon. And in all the times that I've done this, the moon is the same moon that I look at when I'm here at home in the nighttime. I often think to myself, listen, this is what's so amazing about this. In some instances, it's daytime here, and it's nighttime where I'm at. But in the same way, I think to myself, my wife will probably look at the same moon that I'm looking at or my kids or somebody I know. But at the end of the day, there is a way in which we can all look to the Lord God no matter where we are. Because he's the one that created the moon that could be visible by all eyes no matter where you are on the face of the planet. It's the same moon that's seen the murder and the slaughter of innocents on a daily basis. It's the same moon that has seen thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands come to salvation and faith in Christ Jesus. This moon has seen more than any human eyes could have possibly seen. And I say to myself, in the same way, that's how God is. He sees it all. He knows it all. And he's with us through it all. What great hope we can have. I'm pretty sure that that's probably not the heart of the idea that Daniel had. But let me tell you guys something. Daniel didn't change, the Bible says, since his early days. Since his early days. 
Why would he get down three times a day? Some of us have a hard time praying one time a day. It was David in Psalm 55 in verse 17 that says that his prayers would go before the Lord morning, noon, and night. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8 in verse 17, I love those who love me, and they that seek me early shall find me. You see, Absolutely, his heart that surpasses all understanding. A man who petitioned. 14, the king didn't want to charge Daniel with this. The king, maybe for two reasons. I'm a king. I, appoint, I wanted to put Daniel like second in command in the kingdom. Well, that would speak negative about me and my decision-making, or two, which I believe it is, that Daniel's life of righteousness before the Lord God even convicted this king to realize there's no way that he could have done this in the wrong way. It seems to me that the king here realized at this point that they were out to get Daniel. It's interesting how God, listen, so many people worry about a trial or something. This is not fair. Pastor, you don't understand. This is not fair. This is why I'm, I'm fighting this way. No, you need to stop. The Lord is your defense. Before Daniel could even go and present his case before the king, the Lord had already moved upon the heart of the king. He's not even a Christian. He's a Gentile king. You might say, and how can God do that? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21 in verse 1 that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he directs it as the rivers of the water. God is the one who appoints kings and kingdoms, good or bad. Some kings are instruments of judgments to the kingdom that they're over. That's a bad king God will put in power. And some kings are a tremendous blessing to the kingdoms that they're over because God is blessing that kingdom with this good king. Either or, it's the hand of the Lord. It's God's work. It's God's doing. The king here realizes, guys, never, never speaking to Daniel. Listen to this. But talking about this king's official before him, then the Bible says this. Listen to what it says here. He tried to deliver him till the going down of the sun. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, now, O king, this is the law of the Medes. Look at they're pressuring the king that no decree or statute which the king establishes may change. So the king gave the command that they brought Daniel and cast him into the lion's den. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, listen to this, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. I believe here the king was so impressed with Daniel's heart to pray and seek the Lord, even though it meant him losing his life. Why do you think this happened in Daniel's life? If somebody were to look at the story in the life of Daniel, you would say, God, Daniel was a good man. He did a lot of great things. Why? Why would you allow this to happen to him? You know that you and I always ask the why question when we're going through something difficult in our life. Why do I feel this way? God, where are you? What's going on? Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with asking why. Some people get so dogmatic and they say, you could never question God. You ever heard that before? We do question God. Does he strike us down? No. Not at all. There are over 300 whys in the Bible. Not the letter, the question. 300 of them. Most of them are found in the book of Job. And you might say, well, yeah, look at Job's life. Can I remind you something? That the book of Job is actually the first book ever written in the word of God. This has been man's question since man's existence. God, why? Why? Let me give you a couple of reasons why, perhaps. Number one, Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 11. The Bible says, all things after, listen to this, all things are after the consent of his will. God allowed it. This is why. Because God allowed it. It's all after the consent of, then why would God allow it? That's the other question. Well, consider this for a moment. The Lord allowed it to be for what? Number one, to get the glory. To get the glory. God will get the glory in your trial. 
Number two, to reveal his power to the king or anybody else that is trying to take advantage of Daniel. Do you know that God uses your trials to bring others to know who God is? You know that? Your trial, that's why the Bible says, listen guys, when the Bible says that we're to comfort others with the same comfort that we ourselves have been comforted with, what does that tell you? God allowed you to go to that trial, feel that pain, that sorrow, experience all of it, and then he brought you out of it, and then you look back and you say, oh, if it were not for the Lord, he did this, he did that, he did this, he did that, and then that's it, that's your testimony? No. Somebody's going to come to you not too long after, and they're going to say, I just went through what you went through. Then you can say, let me comfort you with the same comfort that I was comforted with. That's the purpose of these things, so that God gets the glory, so that others will know the very power of God. Number three, to expose the lies of the enemy. To expose the lies of the enemy. God allows trials to expose the lies of the enemy. Trials are for his glory. Trials are to reveal his power to those around us. And three, to expose the lies of the enemy. So what does all that benefit you for? It makes you a stronger man or woman of God. Did you know that? How many of you want to be a stronger Christian? Okay, listen. You just enlisted in the university of trials. You just enlisted, right, by raising your hand. That's it. Now it's like, good Lord. Yeah, get used to saying that because he is good and he is Lord, okay? But let me tell you something. We want to be, we pray that God help me. Lord, I don't want to be tempted. God, you know what God does? He says, okay, yes, we, we can do this. But all these trials are lined up for this purpose. You know the awesome thing? God gives you the power to get to every single one of them. The enemy tells you, oh no, you're just a captive. The enemy tells you, where's your God now? The enemy tells you, if he was really God, you wouldn't be feeling what you're feeling right now because if he's good, why do you feel so bad? Oh, somebody doesn't know what I'm talking about today. Nobody's ever gone through mind trips. Nobody's ever felt like giving up. Nobody's ever felt like walking away. As the song says, we sang it last week, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Let me tell you something. Every Christian gets weak in trials. So what do we do? We do what Daniel does. Be aware that you're in the midst of the trial. But pray daily. Trust in the Lord. The Bible says here, Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. This den was a pit in the ground. Listen, guys, with a little tiny ramp going down. They would cover the ramp because this is how they would get the lions in there. And, and then they would, put this, they would put this stone over it. And then they, they placed a signet on the stone, the king's signet. So the stone, the plate, could not be removed. Daniel is placed in the lion's den, guys. And it's sealed by the king's own signet ring with the signet of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace, listen to this, spent the night fasting. Yes, fasting. No musicians were brought before him, also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a, lamp, with a lamenting voice. Lamenting means this, a very grieved voice. There was emotion in it. And he cries out and he says to Daniel in this way, the king spoke saying, Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury, listen to this, no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. Doesn't matter the trial you go through. Listen guys, no injury will be found on you. Isn't this an amazing story? In the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 33, it talks about Daniel in the lion's den. My oldest son in high school, when he was taking Bible, there was a project that was given to the students in the class, and, and he was a little bit bothered by it. 
And he says, you know, Dad, everybody picked all these people in Hebrews chapter 11. I have nobody. My friend's doing this one. My friend's doing it. What do I do? So I looked at him and I says, hey, son, pick Daniel. And he looked at me and he says, Daniel. I said, yeah. And he's like, uh, Dad, I, I know you're a pastor and everything, but Daniel's not in Hebrews chapter 11. I says, oh, yes, he is. He says, oh, no, he's not. I said, oh, yes, he is. Let's open up the Bible. Let's read it, son. So we start to go down the list of all the names. No, Daniel's name, per se, is not in there. My son, as we're reading, he keeps looking at me, and I can see the look on his face. He's thinking, my dad doesn't know the Bible like he thinks he does. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we get to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 33. And it says, and the Lord even shut the mouths of the lions. The moment I read that, my son looked at me and he said, that's talking about Daniel. I said, I told you, son. He's like, these kids will freak out if I do this. They never saw that. I said, it's so amazing, Joseph, to know that one of the greatest acts in Daniel's life was that he had faith in God, that God would deliver him. This was the trial of my son's life. So discouraged, I said, the Lord's going to deliver you like he delivered Daniel. So write this report. And he says he stood up that day and he started to read about Daniel. And he can hear the kids going, it's not even mentioned in there. And they were doing that while he's reading. It. He's just reading it. All of a sudden, he gets to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33. He says it. And all of a sudden, he says the class was silent. He started pulling out their Bibles and this and that. And he says, my dad helped me find this one. Went and sat down. <laughs> Daniel is mentioned in the hall of faith because of his great faith that he had in the Lord God. Guys, let me explain something to you. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 23, Daniel 10, 11, Daniel 10, 19. Daniel is greatly beloved. Daniel is greatly beloved. Daniel's book speaks so much about Jesus and his second coming and God's faithfulness in Jesus as the deliverer. And Daniel said, the Lord, my God, sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lion. And then look at what the king does in response. Daniel's trial brought the king to a place of worshiping Daniel's God. And the king gave the command and brought those men who accused Daniel. And they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 8 says this. The righteous is delivered from trouble. But the wicked takes their place. The righteous Daniel was delivered from trouble. But the wicked that came against him took his place. And the lions overpowered them. Their wives and their kids were taken with them. And the lions broke their bones before their bodies even hit the ground. You might say, how and why would God allow that? According to the law of near ancient Gentile kings, they had no law like the Jews had that spared the children from their parents' sin. It was according to their law. God delivered Daniel because God was doing a work among the heart of this king here, King Darius. Look at what he wrote. The king wrote to all the people, the nations, the languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Notice that. He's saying they must worship the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. You know what, guys? He first declared himself to be God in chapter 6 and verses 6 and 7. Now he's declaring Daniel's God to be the one true God. And steadfast forever, his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure till the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Why did he prosper? Not because he was brought out of the lion's den and not because he prayed three times a day. He prospered because in chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says Daniel purposed in his heart. From the day as a young man, he said, Lord, I'm going to serve you. And all the days of his life, he kept his commitment in serving the Lord. And God delivered him from every circumstance. Let me tell you guys something. You guys might think the story ends there, right? It doesn't. 
As a matter of fact, this story prefigures another stone that was laid on the mouth of a cave and shut with the signet of a king's ring. The story is Jesus. Jesus had accusers also who were trying to find fault in him but could find none. Jesus also had an official that was over him that was afraid to put Jesus to death. Just like Daniel had a king who didn't want him to go into the lion's den, Jesus had Pontius Pilate. And let me tell you something. You might say, well, how does Jesus, how is this a picture? Well, let me tell you something. The Bible says that Satan goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you might say, then how was Jesus saved from the tomb? He died. Yes, he did. But like Daniel, the angel of the Lord came to deliver Daniel and shut the mouth of the lion. The Holy Spirit of God came to the tomb and raised Christ from the dead. And Jesus conquered death and the grave, forever shutting the mouth of the lion. It's Jesus. And the promise of Hebrews 11 is for all of us who have faith in Christ. I don't care what you're going through today. I don't care what confusion, what doubts, what fears. Can I just give you a word of encouragement? Number one, stop listening to the lies of the enemy because you're not who you used to be. You've been bought and purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. And number two, Jesus is with you. He always is. No trial surprises him. Nothing's too difficult for him. All Jesus says to you in the midst of the trial, rest in the promises of my word and I will get you out. Amen? Amen. And one who can conquer death in the grave, I'll tell you what, that's the best one to take you out of any trial you're in.